This morning we come into the presence of a holy God who cannot be grasped, but who can be gazed upon. One who is not easily understood, but is full of understanding, who does not come at our beck and call, but who's always near. In confident assurance that God is here, we gather as God's children and join together in our call to worship. O oh Lord, what a variety of things you have made. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. They all depend on you to give them food as they need it. When you supply it, they gather it. You open your hand to feed them, and they are richly satisfied. But if you withdraw your presence, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath. The life goes out of them, and they become again. The dust of the earth from which you formed them at the start. But when you send out your breath, new life is created. And the face of the earth is made beautiful and is renewed. God, may your glorious presence linger among us forever. May you rejoice in all that you have created. Let us pray. Creator of all the heavens, before the vastness of the universe, we stand in awe, remembering the miracles of creation, those that happened long ago, like the birth of the world, and those that happen every day, like the birth of a child. We just simply cannot comprehend your marvels. Surrounded by the mysteries of life, giving thanks for the knowledge you share, the resources that you provide, we turn to you in worship and praise. So reveal yourself to us in our worship. As your spirit breathes life into all that lives, move among us this morning that we might be refreshed and enlivened. Grant us hearts to worship and voices to sing your praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
The late Robin Williams once made the remark that angels have wings because they take themselves lightly. I think one of the things that we tend to lose, not only as we get older, certainly as Christians, we tend to lose that sense of wonder, that sense of playfulness, uh, that sense of humor that is so prevalent with children. I think when uh, the disciples were arguing over who was going to be greatest in the kingdom and Jesus sat that little child in front of them and said that you have to enter the kingdom of heaven like that little child. I think it's not just the simplicity of a child that he's looking for, but there is a, that playfulness that a child uh, seems to be so much part of uh, a child growing up. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi was one of those rare individuals that never really ever lost his, well, this deep strain of, of foolishness, of playfulness that was inherent with him. One day uh, there began to be a, a, a lot of talk in the town of Assisi about uh, folks thinking he should be made a saint. So what Francis did was go and get one of the other brothers in the order, Brother Juniper. Now, Brother Juniper was, if there were 20 in the graduating class of the, of the monastic order, Brother Juniper would have been last. And so he gets the guy who is the lowest on the totem pole. And so Brother Juniper and Francis uh, uh, go for a walk through town in their underwear. Obviously, indecency laws were somewhat less in those days than they are now. And that worked for a little while. But then once, uh, after a few years, the talk about making a, uh, Francis into a saint began again. And so once again, he seeks out his good friend, Brother Juniper, and uh, they go uh, walking through town once again. This time they're carrying a large plank. And when they get to the center of the town, they take the plank and they balance it on top of a stone and they seesawed there in the town square all day long. To be a holy fool, to be playful in the service of God means to, well, it means for us to stop trying to look like something more than what we really are. I think a lot of us are just afraid of looking foolish. We're afraid of what others might say. That's when you know, as you eventually have to know, that underneath our clothes, we're all naked and that we don't need to pretend to be better than we are. As Popeye the Sailor Man always said, I am what I am. And that creation, for some inexplicable, unfathomable reason, is the creation that God loves, precisely because of its unique. Our true identity and our deepest freedom comes from the infinite love that God has for us. Doesn't come from what people think of us. Doesn't come from what people say about us. Because when it comes right down to it, both those that praise us and those who hate us usually, well, they're usually doing it for the wrong reasons anyway. So may the Lord deliver us from the tyranny of the opinions of others as we confess our sins before God and before each other. Lord, we are a self-absorbed people. Our thinking is skewed. Our purposes are scattered. Our sense of self-importance, our obsessive desire to push our own agendas, our quest for control have left little room in our lives for you. We've lost our sense of who we are and who you are. Forgive us of all those times we have taken you and your creation for granted and those times we haven't thought of you at all. Through your grace, help us to recenter and refocus our lives so that we may truly be in relationship with you and with all that you have created. My children, the God of creation, the God of mercy is quick to forgive and his promise of restoration is for, it's for everyone. So hear and believe this good news that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven.
let us boldly but humbly go before the throne of grace. God of glory, we praise you for your presence in our lives, for all the goodness that you shower upon us in Jesus Christ. And we, we recognize, Lord, that you do that, not because we are good, but because you're good. Especially we praise and thank you for the promises that you keep, for the hope that you give us for tomorrow, the enjoyment of friends, of family, wonders of your creation, love from our spouse, our families, our children, our faith, and our church. Remind us, Lord, that we are all your children. And as we pray this morning, we offer prayers for all of those whom you love. Especially we pray for those that we too often forget, people that have lost hope, those who are mourning, those who suffer because of war or violence, those who are lonely or sick, those who are hungry. And especially this morning, we pray for Betty and Raymond, for Margin. Father, we know we have been called to serve. And in the quietness of these moments, we confess our shortcomings. In the face of all the worldly unrest and tragedy and the mayhem and the murder, the illness and the death, we acknowledge that Far too often we feel powerless. We realize anew the difficulties we have in being your faithful servants and wonder if we are indeed able to drink that cup that you set before us. When we get to that point, Lord, keep us mindful that it, it's not all up to us. Help us to remember that the source of our service is also the source of our strength and our hope. And that is the delicious, wonderful paradox in which we live. We know that you're with us always, even to the very end of time. We pray in the sure knowledge that your love for us never lets us go. Even when we falter in our service, we pray with confidence as your children the prayer of the one whom we serve. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. First of our lections that we will 
here this morning is from the uh, epistle from to the Hebrews, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Now, every high priest that is selected to represent men and women before God and offer sacrifices for their sins should be able to deal gently with their failings since he knows what it's like from his own experience, but that also means that he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as those of the people. No one elects themselves to this honored position. They're called to it by God, just like Aaron was. Neither did Christ presume to set himself up as a high priest, but was set apart by the one that said to him, you are my son, today I celebrate you. In another place, God declares, you're a priest forever in the royal order of Melchizedek. And while he lived on earth, anticipating death, Jesus cried out in pain and wept in sorrow as he offered up priestly prayers to God. Because he honored God, God answered him. And though he was God's son, he learned trusting obedience by what he suffered, just like we do. Then having arrived at the full stature of his maturity and having been announced by God as high priest and the order of Melchizedek, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who believingly obey him. Our gospel text this morning is from the 10th chapter of Mark, verses 35 through 45. Now James and John, Zebedee's boys, came up to Jesus and they said, Teacher, we got something you want, we want you to do for us. Jesus said, well, well, what is it? I'll, I'll see what I can do. And they said, arrange it so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory. One of us sitting on the right, the other one sitting on the left. Jesus said, you guys have no clue what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, to be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be plunged into? Sure, they said, why not? Jesus said, you know what, now that I think about it, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with my baptism. But as to awarding places of honor, that's really not any of my business. There are other arrangements for that. Well, when the other 10 disciples heard about this conversation, they were not at all happy. So Jesus got them all together to settle things down. He said, you have observed how godless rulers throw their weight around. And when folks get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must be a servant. Whoever wants to be first must be the slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage.
the ships, cut the ties, send a flare into the night. Say a prayer, turn the tide, dry your tears and wave goodbye. Step into a new day. We can rise up from the dust and walk away. We can dance upon the heart. Yeah. So light a match, leave the past, burn the ships, and don't you look back. So long to shame. Walk through the sorrow, out of the fire, into tomorrow. So flush the pills, face the fear, feel the way it disappear. We're coming clean, we're born again. I hope our lungs can breathe again. Oh, we can breathe again. <laughs> And step into a new day We can rise up from the dust And walk away We can dance upon the heart yeah. So let the match Leave the past Burn the ships And don't you look back Let us pray. Lord, when we are honest with you and ourselves, we admit that understanding very often eludes us. We hate the way this world works. We struggle to believe in your goodness and grace, if we even believe in you at all. We hate that it's hard to live here. We hate all the pain and the suffering in, in our lives and the lives of others and the lives of the world. So somehow, some way, Lord, shed your light upon our hearts. Help us in our unbelief and our mistrust. We need you to lie in our way, even, even if it's just a glimmer and even if it's just short-lived. Let the scriptures and their proclamation this morning light our way. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The lesson for the message this morning is from the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 38, verses 1 through 7 and 34 through 41. And now finally, God answered Job out of the midst of the storm. And he said, why are you confusing the issue? Why are you talking without knowing what in the world you're talking about? Pull yourself together, Job, up on your feet, stand tall. I have some questions for you. And I want some straight answers. So where, where were you when I created the earth? Tell me, since you seem to know so much. Who decided on its size? Certainly you know that. Who came up with the blueprints and the measurements? How was its foundation poured? Who set the cornerstone while the Stars, the morning stars sang in chorus and all the angels shouted praise. Can you get the attention of the clouds and commission a shower of rain? Can you take charge of the lightning bolts and have them report to you for orders? Who, who do you think gave, the, gave weather wisdom to the ibis and storm savvy to the rooster? 
Does anybody know enough to number all the clouds or tip over the rain barrels of heaven when the earth is cracked and dry and the ground is baked as hard as a brick? Can you teach the lioness to stalk her prey and satisfy the appetite of her cubs as they crouch in their den waiting hungrily in their cave? And who sets out food for the ravens when their young cry to God fluttering about because they have no food? Word of God for the people of God. God. Mother is sitting at the computer. And she's going through, kind of going through her email. And of course, her little boy is trying to get her attention. And she is so distracted with what she's doing. She's barely paying attention. He keeps, mom, mom, you know. And finally, she says, he says to her, says, mom, he said, that reminds me a lot of the Lord's Prayer. And she looked at him real funny and said, what do you mean it reminds you of the Lord's Prayer? She said, yeah, you, you know, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from email. <laughs> Distractions. We got Facebook, we got Twitter, we got Instagram, we got YouTube, we got Wikipedia, we got Snapchat. Chat. Together, all of these are weapons of mass distraction. And you know, you know how it works. I mean, you're, you're in the kitchen, you're cooking, and all of a sudden you get a ping on your smartphone. And so you, you just in the back of your head, you go, okay, well, while dinner's on the stove, I'll just, I'll just see what this notification is about. And so you start looking and go, oh, oh, okay. I, I have to reply to this post. And you, you reply to that. Uh, oh, in that picture of that kitty cat, isn't that just so silly? And, and you watch that. And of course, then there's a puppy video that you have to watch. And then there, there there's a there's an email from a high school guy that you knew, and and this guy is just so far off base. You just have to respond to that. And then of course there's that Wikipedia article that's just just chock full of all kinds of good information. Meanwhile, you got a five alarm fire going on in your kitchen. And you can't figure out why the fire department's sitting out in your sitting out in your in your garage. Most of us react to all those beeps and pings and buzzes on our phones with a tremendous amount of urgency, almost as much urgency as parents give when they're responding to to the cry of a child. And deep down in our heart of hearts, intuitively we know that this is not healthy, that it's not sane, <laughs> and yet we we still keep doing it. My wife and I will go out somewhere to eat and you can hear you can hear that ping of a smartphone and look around. Somebody's going, ooh, ooh, and you know, almost immediately that, that rascal comes out. But now research is showing that we really need to make an effort to avoid mindless distractions like this. You see, when we get lost in the social media or email, when we get caught up in all those things, we tend to lose our ability to focus. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to read your email, right? And we get so caught up in doing these very superficial things that we lose the ability to focus with any, with any degree of success. It really is a, a matter of use it or lose it. Cal Newport, who's a computer scientist at Georgetown University, authored a book entitled Deep Work, The Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World. Now, he believes that we should minimize the problems that are caused in our lives by these constant interruptions that come to us via our smartphones and our computers. And he insists that, that these things are much more insidious in our lives than we, than we realize. You see, the problem is this. When we let, when we let our emails, when we let Facebook, uh, when we let all those social media messages guide our work day, we are weakening our ability to do the most challenging kinds of work. This is what Newport calls deep work. This is the work that requires a, a depth of attention, things like writing a report or solving an engineering problem or doing significant research. I think that's one of the reasons why 
Uh, if you go to McDonald's, they don't have numbers on the cash registers anymore. They have pictures. You see, the solution to all these distractions is to do what we can to set aside portions of the day to involve ourselves in things like deeper thinking. Now, I know it might hurt at first, but it's important. What this means is no social media, limited email, strict limits on appointments. But the result of that, you see, is a richer life, a more fulfilling life, something that is vastly better than sort of res robotically responding to all those emails and clicking on websites, and which is what a lot of us wind up doing all day long. I, I would be afraid to hazard a guess how many emails I get in a day, I probably get at least 100, 150, 200 a day. And there's, no, you know, I, I can spend an, I can spend that time going through them, but, you know, I have to ask myself the question, is it really worth it? Now, in a lot of modern churches, contemporary churches, uh, an announcement is made on Sunday morning, the pre-worship media feed, reminding people to turn off their smartphone. Now, sometimes it is the pastor that makes this announcement, or maybe the worship leader will make that announcement. That's not really anything I do, because in my opinion, a scowl of withering disapproval from the pulpit cast in your direction whenever your smartphone dings really should be incentive enough. But even at that, one of the things I notice is that it is extremely difficult, even for church people, you see, to go through even an hour without checking messages. As if suddenly in that hour something is going to happen that's not that's that's earth shattering. Any of you see the movie uh, The Devil Wears Prada? The ladies are going, yeah, yeah, yeah. The men are going, what? It's a chick flick, okay? But in the movie, in the movie, Andy's boss, Miranda, is one of those, she's an editor of a fashion magazine, and, and believes that when you are hired as her assistant, that that means she has the uh, ability, the right, to be able to make unreasonable demands at you, on you at any given time during the day or night. And it's the fallout from that kind of an attitude that, sort of precipitates a scene between Andy and her boyfriend. They're having, a, having an argument. We call them heated discussions. Having an argument about how much time Andy's devoting to her job, how it's changed not just simply the way she looks, but how she relationships with, with her friends. And it's about that time that her cell phone rings. And, so she whips it out and looks at it, and she says, it's my boss, I have to take this call. To which her boyfriend replies, very profound, the person whose call you always have to take is the one that you're in relationship with. So who are you in relationship with? Whose call do you always take? Whose message do you always answer? In the Old Testament reading for this morning, God challenges a fellow by the name of Job to involve himself in this, this job of doing deep work, that is, answering the question, the very basic question about who he is in relationship to God. Now, I don't want to see anybody, I don't want to see you going for your smartphone because it's not a question you can, you can find the answer to on Google. It rather involves deep thinking about what it means for us to be human beings created by God. And the challenge that God gives to Job, you see, is the same uh, challenge he gives to each one of us. One that really kind of pushes us to unplug long enough to ask and answer some very deep questions. For starters, who is God? Well, that's a pretty big question. 
And if we search the internet, then we're going to find that God is love, God is holy, God is Father, God is Jesus, God is spirit, God is almighty, he's omnipotent, he's merciful. We could add a whole lot of other stuff. And none of those answers is wrong. But you see, those kind of answers can be distracting. They can really be much too much information. I have a philosophy about information. We live in an information age. The only trouble is when you are inundated with a plethora of information, in fact, more information than you can really process, then it's as bad, if not worse, than having no information at all. A man who has one watch knows what time it is. A man who has two watches never is sure, you see. Kind of like when my daughter was about, oh, she was about seven, was before Becky and I got married, and my daughter comes to me one day, and uh, I was a single parent, and she asked the dreaded question, Daddy, where do babies come from? Well, I was not unprepared, you see, because as a single parent, I knew eventually that one day, that day would come. And so I had spent a tremendous amount of time figuring out just exactly how I was going to answer that question. I wanted to do it as, as the best way that I possibly could. I wanted to give her, arm her with every piece of information that I could find. And so I sat her down and I went through the whole spiel. I mean, I had graphs, you know, presentations, you name it. I, yeah, I'm okay. I didn't say it was smart. I just, so... Uh, we, so I went through this for about an hour and then got through and, you know, and I asked her, I said, do you understand? And she said, yes. Well, uh, after a little while, Becky came over that evening and I had gone in the back for some reason and I overheard her talking to Becky and she goes up and she says, Becky said, I, where do babies come from? And Becky said, hon, that's a question you really ought to ask your dad. And she said, well, I did, but I don't think he knows either. <laughs> Too much information. Information that we can't process is the same as not having information at all. So God keeps it real simple here for Job when he talks to him out of the whirlwind. And he just asks a question. He says, Job, where were you when I created earth? In other words, where were you, insert your name here, when I, God, created the earth? Both the you and the I, you see, are important. In his book, The Institutes of Christian Religion, Protestant reformer uh, John Calvin unveils one of the guiding principles of his theology, that of the twofold knowledge of God. Calvin argues that our knowledge of God consists of two parts, knowing God as the creator, knowing God as the redeemer. And anchored to this is our knowledge of who we are, our knowledge of ourselves. Knowledge of God on the one hand, knowledge of ourselves on the other. These are connected. They are interrelated, according to Calvin. And you can't have one without the other. Without having a knowledge of self, then you cannot have a knowledge of God. And so that's why God asked Job from the whirlwind, Job, just tell me, where were you when I created the earth? I mean... <laughs> You know so much. Knowledge and self-knowledge of God are both important. Who decided on the size of the earth? Certainly, you, you know that. Who came up with the blueprints and the measurements? How was the foundation poured? Who set the cornerstone? You see, this, this voice from the whirlwind is asking Job a series of questions that Job just simply cannot answer. And the reason Job can't answer those questions is because he's finite. He's human. Only the infinite God knows the answer to those questions. And that is the first lesson that comes from the whirlwind. Job, 
creature, God, creator. Now, this is something that we need to hear. I know it sounds kind of, you know, like, duh. But it's something we need to hear because we live in an age where there are so many different kinds of technological marvels that we we tend to confuse those things that are God-like. Peter Thiel, one of Silicon Valley's high priests, recently said humans are distinguished from other species by their ability to be able to work miracles. And we call these miracles technology. If you've ever had a computer crash, I'm not sure that you'd call that kind of technology miraculous. Now, technology may be helpful, it may be a tool, but it's a long way from being miraculous. In fact, the downside to technology is that it can uh, it can create polluting factories, it can narrow corporate interests, uh, it can uh, result in the marketing of personal data in ways that, that hurt individuals as well as groups. Only God is the creator. Humans can be creative, we can develop marvelous technology, but we cannot work miracles. We weren't present. We weren't there when God laid the foundations of the earth. So we cannot do God's miraculous work. God is the creator of all that is, including us. So the deep question, who is God, can be answered with the word creator. But what about the more specific question? Who are we? What does it mean? For us to be human creatures. Well, God answers this in part as the one who gives us wisdom and gives us understanding. As creatures who are made in the image of God, we are those individuals who've been given wisdom and understanding by the Creator. Now, does that mean that we know it all? No, it doesn't. It means that we have been given a, a modicum of wisdom and understanding by God. And when we do the deep work that God asks us to do, we realize that even though we have wisdom, even though we have understanding, we don't have all the answers only God does. There was a time when I, right after I got out of divinity school, uh, I actually thought I had all the answers. Boy, isn't that a joke. I don't even understand all the questions. I thought I had all the answers. And quite frankly, I don't know how you guys existed as long as you did uh, with, without me being here. And that, that thud that you hear, that was this preacher falling off of his pedestal because I came to understand that I don't have all the answers, that only God has the answers. And unfortunately, a lot of times, he don't share those with me. But... We can have wisdom, we can have understanding, we can have the ability to search for answers, the potential to find answers as we live in relationship with God and as we live in relationship with each other. Those are learning relationships. This world that we live in is very complex. It is very painful. But the God who laid the foundations of the world did so, so that there wouldn't be a world and so that we would be in it. And so the Creator wants us to live in relationship with Him, to share the wisdom, to share understanding, to share, you see, the love of the divine. Back last March, Stephen Hawking uh, died uh, at the age of 76. Uh, Stephen Hawking had spent an entire lifetime studying the universe. He inspired people with his, uh, with his intelligence, with his humor, uh, with the, the tremendous insights that, that as a theoretical physicist he had into the Big Bang, which is uh, how a lot of people believe that God laid the foundations of the earth. 
One thing Hawking knew how to do was have focus. And he was a man who was always looking for wisdom and always looking for understanding. He also had a very crippling disease. When he was 21 years old, Hawking was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And after he had a throat operation back in the, I think it was like in the 1980s, he designed an electronic voice system which allowed him to enjoy sophisticated computerized communication. And although Hawking relied on a wheelchair and a voice system, he was always connected to others. And you see, in that respect, he was, he was really like all of us, all too human and always dependent on others, whether it was on uh, human beings or on machines. Even the life of Stephen Hawking reminds us that none of us, none of us acts alone. Our being and our acting requires a network of, of support. So the question, who are we, can be answered in part by the word is social. We are social animals. We are, we are herd creatures. We are created, we are hard-coded by God to be in relationship with each other and with God. None of us can survive long, you see, by ourselves. We need the support, the accountability of others. And it is fortunate for us that God has created a world in which we can be connected in ways that we have never been able to be connected before. A world in which God provides for all creatures, whether they be human beings, down to lions, ravens, whatever. The Apostle Paul built on this understanding when he, when he likened the church to being like a human body. And he said, who are we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members of one another. All of this comes from God who has given us wisdom, who has given us understanding in the mind. When we free ourselves from distractions, when we get to the point where we can actually focus, when we reach that that, that place where we can really delve into the significant questions of life. We discover that our creator is the source of all wisdom and all understanding. John Calvin knew this. He said that the endowments which we possess cannot possibly come from ourselves. Our very being is nothing else than a subsistence in God alone. We are not independent. Knowledge of God as creator, knowledge of ourselves as social beings, as being connected to God, as being connected to each other. And when we put the two of those together, then we're doing the deep work that God wants us to do. Let us pray. God of glory and honor, we, your servants, come before you as broken people, people who have our own agendas, people who want life to be good and easy, people who, if we see a need that somebody has, we're just as likely to turn away as not. We want the seats of honor and all the respect that comes with them, but we don't want that cup of responsibility. We can't seem to care for ourselves. So how can we assist a world that's in disarray? Lord, you have children every day that go to bed hungry, alone, afraid, sick, hopeless. We have heard the cry of the needy and we have turned away. We not only pray for ourselves, but for all your children, wherever they are. We pray that we could hear your call to be a servant to the least, a servant to the lost. In Jesus' name, amen. With the power given from God, shout no to those who promised the whole world if you just worship them. Crucify those old mechanisms of power to 
push harder, to drive faster, to climb higher, to grasp more tightly, to trample with impunity, instead turn to a new life of power, one of love and joy and peace and patience and all the fruits of the Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.